Hello, and welcome to Rogue Artisans and Crafters, winner of the 2018 Southern Oregon Television Awards for Best Arts and Culture Show. I'm your host, David Glamour Dave Meenow. We welcome you, our viewer, to our show, where we feature local artists and craftspeople here in Southern Oregon. With our show, we like to talk to our featured artists about how they came to their art, what drives them as artists, find out stories behind their art, their art process, and how their work as artists influences their lives. Today, we have the opportunity to feature local artist, Linda Hoffman Snodgrass. Linda was just recently on this show in regards to our featured gallery show about Art and Soul Gallery in Ashland. Linda is one of the directors of the gallery, and with her help, we were able to discuss Art and Soul Gallery and its artists. Linda is a wonderful artist in her own right, creating beautiful abstracts. She comes from a line of artists in her family, and so today we will talk to Linda Hoffman Snodgrass about her life as an artist and the work that she pursues today with her art. And so welcome, Linda, to the show. Well, thanks for having me back. Yes. Well, we had fun during our last uh, last visit, and uh, so let's uh, continue on with the fun and talk about you now and make you the focus. <laughs> Sounds good. So to begin with, how long have you been working as a professional artist? I quit working for other businesses and went professional in 1980. Okay. And... Uh, uh, and from my understanding, your I mean, art has been a, uh, a key thing uh, throughout your life and, and in your family, in fact. Yes, I'm a third generation artist. Okay, so that takes you back to your mother and your grandmother being artists. And remember. my grandfather. And grandfather, oh, okay. Um, we actually happen to have some uh, family photos of, uh, that you provided uh, of your family of artists. Uh, so if the, if the control room could uh, bring up uh, those uh, pictures and we could talk a little about your family and, uh, and their art history. Well, my great-grandfather was a rotogravure. Um, he printed books. Okay. And this is his son, my grandfather, DeWitt Pat Peterson. And this is probably around 1900, 19, between maybe 1910. Yeah. Right in there, he studied art at the Chicago Art Institute. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a, a pretty famous uh, art school. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so let's go on to the next. We have a. And here he is graduating with his class. Um, this could be about 1912. Yeah. He's the gentleman in the light-colored sweater with the blue dot on his arm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's go on to the next. And this is his wife, my grandmother, Magda Patterson. She was in a garden club, and they said, go home and paint two of your favorite flowers. And uh -huh. she had so much fun doing this. She quit the garden club and <laughs> took up painting. Yeah. And my grandfather mentored her. He had all yeah. this wonderful instruction at the right. Chicago Art Institute. So here she is uh, holding a painting that was purchased for the Naperville Library in Illinois, and it is on their permanent public collection. Uh -huh. Oh, that's, that's cool. Okay, and let's go on to the next. This is my mother with Richard, my mother is e Elaine Hoffman with Richard Hazelton, and they're holding a painting of my mother's that went on tour with the Watercolor Society of Oregon, which was founded 50 years ago. Okay, and uh, there's one more. And that's one of my mother's paintings. Yeah. She she was well established here in the Northwest during her lifetime as a watercolorist. Mm -hmm. She taught for Portland Community College and just yeah. did wonderful things. And I think there's one more actually. Yeah. Yes, this is my my grandmother, Magda, and my mother Elaine and myself all being artists together. Yeah. This is the early 1960s, I think, late 1950s. Well, it sounds like you have a, a lot of uh, a lot of fun artistic memories uh, uh, through your family, uh, and, uh, and with art being a, a strong component in your life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, you you are primarily uh, doing abstracts these days, um, but I've, you've also done some like realistic kinds of. Of, uh, of art pieces as well. Yes, right. I was professionally trained to sketch and paint what I sketched right. and what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. So uh, my work was very representational and very tight with realism. Right, and so what was it uh, uh, that brought you into the world of abstracts and what drove you into that uh, arena to what you're doing now? 
well, people were saying your your paintings look just like a photograph. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. well, I could take a photograph and <laughs> it'd be just as exciting. Maybe, you know, play with it. Uh -huh. So I tried to loosen up and be more splashy and more arty and put more of me into it rather right. than what I was seeing into yeah. it. And um, in doing that, I found myself just going back and getting very tight and very realistic. So I found that by breaking away with anything that looked representational to me, going totally abstract, right. I was able to find this new voice within myself. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing a lot of images that are kind of um, based on dreams and, and the unconscious and bringing them into the conscious. Mm -hmm. And you'll see on my newer paintings, uh, my signature is is vertical, and it is mirror writing oh, okay. to represent the the waking and the dreaming. Yeah, and right. The conscious and the and the unconscious. Yeah. Well, uh, in your as a your primary uh, media that you use is watercolor. Correct. Correct. So even in your when you're in your realistic uh, phase, you're able to achieve. Uh, close to uh, uh, photorealism in, in watercolor is yeah, basically what it sounded Absolutely, like. and, and many artists do that. I because uh, um, my understanding for like uh, a lot of the uh, photorealistic artists that, I'm, that I know of tend to use uh, airbrush as a technique mm. for achieving that. So mm -hmm. the fact that you're achieve, you were achieving that in watercolor uh, I find uh, pretty incredible. It takes a lot of hours. <laughs> I can imagine. A yeah. lot of hours. Yeah. Uh, but in going into the abstract realm, um, uh, you talk about dreams as being an, an influence. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there are there other influences uh, outside of dreams that kind of where you get your ideas from that kind of that lead you down to the creation of the images that you're doing now? Sometimes I'll just see something and right. I'll like the way the shapes are, are aligned and the values and mm -hmm. try to bring that back into a piece. A lot of the paintings that I've been doing have been experimental watercolors and um, they just start spontaneous and free and then as the painting develops it comes together and I see the composition coming right. out and the value scales and working with the color harmony mm -hmm. and pull all that together. Right, okay. Um, now we happen to have uh, some images of your work, uh, on, not only on display here uh, uh, behind us, but uh, also that we'll bring up uh, from the control room. But let's begin with some of the images that we have on display right now. Uh, okay. What are these images that we have here on the set? Well, the one behind you there, uh, that is the Herald of Spring, and, and that's a looser representational piece uh -huh. of a daffodil. Okay. Um, as we come around, this is titled Blessings Come Forth, and I, I um, see orbs as angels, and to me this is a, a painting about angels coming out into the world. Mm, okay. This one is titled Waking, Between Waking and Dreams, and it's that moment just when you become aware and you try to catch the, your dreams and, and realize you're awake. Yeah, right. <laughs> and things are kind of kind of snapping too and you can see like the electrical yeah. force going through on that one yeah. and the, the dreams kind of bubbling up. Um, this one is titled Awakening and again it's got that angel theme of angels coming forth into yeah. the world. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, if the control room could bring up uh, uh, the uh, art images that, uh, that we have for Linda, and we'll kind of begin to kind of talk about these. Now, uh, I found these, this is like the first one, this is like an early thing that you did uh, in your art life, right? Yeah, when I was 10 years old, I started <laughs> painting rocks. Yeah. And I have painted thousands of rocks, <laughs> let me tell you. I sold them for 25 cents to a dollar and saved a lot of the money 
By the time I was 17, I was able to go to Europe oh, wow. for eight weeks well, that in the case and of study of... the art and architecture. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of rocks. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of rocks. To... <laughs> I did do other things yeah. during the meantime, paintings and such, right. but that was my, my means to get to Europe. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, a unique way of financing a trip to Europe, I, and, and that has to be a lot of rocks to sold to help you get there. So A lot of trips to the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's uh, go on to the next uh, image. And uh... In the 1980s, I did a series that I call my Eagle Feathers series, uh -huh. and it was based on Native American um, worldviews and my experience with the Native American community. Right. And this one is titled Moon Dance and graced the cover of the Wee Moon date book uh, back in 1990, I wow. believe it okay. was. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. Uh, let's go on to the next. This is Grandmother Moon, which is probably the most um, famous of my pieces that came out of the Eagle Feather series in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and let's go on to the next. Yeah, this gets into some of your realistic uh, kinds of... Uh, this is the early 1990s. Yeah. This is titled Amore, and it was juried into the Watercolor Society of Oregon show. Yeah, okay. And uh, then we've got... Uh, Peppers. This is also in the, the 1990s. This is Who Wants to Blister the Peppers. Uh -huh. It was juried into the Adirondacks uh, exhibition of American watercolors and received the Bradley C. Bernard Award. And this one you can really see the realism that yeah. I was attaining with mm -hmm. watercolor. Well, I find it amazing that you get that level of realistic uh, 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 interpretation in watercolor. Uh, you know, so I, I find that pretty amazing. Because oh, my my experience with watercolor is nothing close to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I commend you for having the, the skill and talent to, to pull that off. That's that's really a cool thing to see. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go on to the next uh, image. Now this is titled Tribal Essence, and this is on a paper that's no longer made. It's oh. called Watman Watercolor Paper and it was just yummy to, to paint on. It absorbed the paint into it like um, blotter paper and created just amazing, amazing textural effects and color. Yeah, okay, and let's go on to the next. That's a, a, one of my newer, or actually one of my earlier abstracts, and this is watercolor with gouache layered over it. Okay, all right, let's go on to the next. This is Pagoda, and Pagoda is a very, very large painting. Um, it's on what's called an elephant-sized sheet of paper, and I'm trying to remember, it's something like 42 inches by 30-some oh, wow. inches. Oh, wow, yeah, that's a, that's a big piece. It's yeah. a real big piece of paper, and I sold this one to the people that bought the Tribal Essence painting. Mm, okay. And when they purchased it, they just, they made my, my life. I was so excited. Um, they said, we're, we're thinking we're probably going to have to recover our stickly couch <laughs> to go with this painting. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's the one way of uh, uh, believing in the quality of an artist's work, you know. Oh, I'll tell you, that made, made my day, yeah. made my life. I just was <laughs> like, oh my goodness, because everyone always wants a painting to go with their couch. Yeah, right. And to recover a stickly <laughs> for the painting was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's uh, go on to the next uh, image. Now, this is a mixed media piece. Okay. And it is watercolor with tissue paper that has been colored with watercolor, acrylic, and, um, well, the collage of the tissue paper. Okay. Yeah, let's go on to the next. This also is one of those mixed media pieces. Okay. Yeah, let's go on to the next. This piece was juried into the Watercolor Society of Oregon show and was part of um, a Masters of Oregon Water Media Artist show that was held up in Portland. Okay. And it is uh, watercolor and gouache. All right. I yeah, think. let's go on to the next. This one also uh, was in a Watercolor Society of Oregon show. And the Watercolor Society of Oregon has been just really instrumental in my life. I. Um, 
grew up with it. My mother became a member when it was one year old mm. in 1967. Okay. So I've pretty much been with this organization since its inception. Yeah. Uh, I'm a past president of the Watercolor Society of Oregon and also a recipient of their service award. Oh, okay. So it's a great honor. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it definitely is a reflection of uh, your quality of work as an artist and your commitment to the craft. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's good recognition for what you've done and achieved. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a cool thing to see. Thank you. And uh, so let's go on to the next. Now, this is um, a painting that was received an award from the International Society of Experimental Artists and was part of their member show and it was online for a year. Okay. It was a great honor to receive an award from them. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's go on to the next. This one received a second place award at the Watercolor Society of Oregon. This is Hawaiian Sunrise. Oh, and it is all watercolor with just a little bit of acrylic. Okay, now let's go on to the next. This is titled Sprites and Sprites was juried into the Small Painting Exchange with the National Watercolor Society and the Sichuan Society in China. And it went over to China and was shown in a museum and a grand library there. And then came back to the United States and was exhibited at the National Watercolor Society's Exhibition Hall. Oh, okay. Well, now you've got... Um, uh, Two things uh, struck me uh, in looking at those images. One is that uh, the one image that you did on uh, on paper that is no longer uh, available. Mm -hmm. uh, so how often, as an artist, does that kind of situation uh, come up where you know you're you get into using a certain uh, material and then next thing you know. <laughs> it it has happened quite a few times, yeah. actually, um, that I've seen and been, been also uh, experienced. Yeah. Um, this Wattman paper was a joy. It was my grandmother's paper, and when she passed away, my mother g received it. And there were only seven sheets left uh. when my mother passed away and I received it. Um, so I have a few more, few more sheets of yeah. it. There was a watercolor called warm sepia that Winsor Newton used to make, mm -hmm. and they no longer manufacture that paint. And it was one that uh, was a favorite of many artists, including myself. Yeah. Well, you know, in, uh, I've worked as a professional photographer and, and started working mm -hmm. before, the, before digital took over the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know like in, there are, old film stocks that are no longer, you know, made, right? And, uh, and so I find it interesting to, to learn that, uh, that there are old art paper stocks that are no longer made that are, that, uh, uh, that are you know, retired. And, and so paper can be retired just as much as film stock can be retired. Well, the company went out of business, yeah. I think. Or yeah. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just stop making it I don't but, know but I find it's, uh, that that other areas of art deal with that same kind of uh, of, an, of an issue mm -hmm. uh, so the other thing that strikes me is the fact that you've got uh, there's been mention of experimental art mm -hmm. right so what is it about uh, uh, an art piece that is experimental is it the type of media? Is it the, the application of materials? What makes a piece an experimental piece uh, for an artist? It is the application of the materials um, and the other aids that you use in applying the paint. Mm -hmm. um, if you just put a bunch of paint on a piece of watercolor paper and tilt it uh -huh, right. and manipulate the paint that way, that's considered experimental as opposed to taking a brush and putting the paint on with the brush. Right, okay. So it's the... It's, Various it, techniques. Yeah, so it's the, it's the combination of techniques applied mm -hmm. is what's making a piece an experimental piece. You, you don't have the control over the, the paint. Right, 
Okay. You don't know what it's going to do <laughs> until <laughs> it's dry. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and is that uh, a common thing that you're doing in, in the majority of your art, or is that just like an occasional thing that you're doing? Or is it... I, you know, I do I do it quite a bit, and yeah. I do teach classes okay. on experimental watercolor techniques. Uh -huh. okay. um, I find that it's it's really freeing and really kind of fun. Yeah, well, I would imagine that kind of it uh, that idea kind of intrigues me. Uh, it'd be, I'd be interested to take one of your classes and 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 learn those kinds of techniques and just kind of see what the what I would wind up creating. Great. You know. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should have some coming up this summer. Yeah. And uh, and so you do uh, 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 lessons as a regular part of your of your studio work. Uh, off and on. Yeah. Off and on. I, I am more of a studio artist than I am a teacher. Right. Okay. And um, uh, the uh, now, in terms of the, the pricing of your art, uh, what's the general price range for someone that's wanting to, that, uh, that enjoys your art and wants to begin collecting? Well, these paintings uh, in the gallery right now are selling for $1,200. Okay. And boy, that, the ones that are half this size, I think are 780 and then they go down to about 500 framed. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, matted, of course, they're going to yeah. be quite a bit less. The mm -hmm. framing is expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's the typical sizes for most of your art uh, that you do? The, the, what you see here is yeah. is my favorite size to work in, and this is called a full full size sheet watercolor. Mm -hmm. It's um, 21 by 29 inches okay. approximately. Yeah. Okay. That's something that uh, um, that. Uh, I find, at, you know, I, at having been a pro photographer and having had to deal with uh, issues of matting and framing, uh, is the the sheer variety of odd size dimensions <laughs> that that the art industry seems to have to uh, to to offer out there. You know, uh, so uh, uh, I've always wondered why that is. You know, that's just something that I don't know. It's just personal. Personal pro issue with me, <laughs> odd sizes for uh, for framing uh, uh, dimensions. But um, well, you can buy watercolor rolls. Yeah. That are like forty eight inches tall. Right. And ten yards long. Oh wow. And cut your paper yeah. to the size you want. Many people now are um, adhering them to like uh, masonite or uh, cradle boards. Mm -hmm. So and then covering them with um, different acrylic mediums, so they become permanent and are no longer needing to be under glass, right? Okay, and can just be framed and and put out and yeah. be any size. Yeah, okay, and uh, uh, the um, so the small size that you're going to have uh, is uh, going to be. Uh, the prices are going to start about $500. In, well, I, I, in I have pieces for $30 oh, that really? are matted at the art gallery. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, it so is. someone's... Uh, it's uh, a full spectrum. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so beyond the, the originals, you also have you also offer prints? Uh, I offer prints via uh, my website. Right, okay. And it's an online, online print house that I work with. Mm -hmm. So people that are interested in my images in print form can go to my website and connect to that link and go to the, the I think it's Fine Art America. Right, okay. That's who I use. Yeah. And, uh, and so your website address is lindahoffmansnodgrass.com, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. all, all, all together. Small letters yeah. together, and, no uh, hyphen. Do you have any uh, social media sites? You have I have Facebook? a Facebook page, Linda Hoffman Snodgrass Artist. Okay. And uh, you have a, do you have an Instagram or Twitter or anything else? I do have an Instagram. I haven't been real active okay. on it, but um, there's a few things. Okay. And I have a Pinterest site that I use for teaching okay. and also for fun. Yeah. Okay. And um, so there. Uh, let's see. Is there is there anything that we haven't covered at this point that I that uh, before we get ready to wrap up that uh, that you'd like to let the audience know? 
I think we're doing pretty yeah. good. Your, your, your work is currently on display uh, at, at Art, Art and Soul, Soul Gallery. Art and Soul Gallery. And I'm also represented by the Crystal Room in Mount Shasta. Okay. All right. Well, Linda, I appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, and being able to talk about your work. Uh, you do some beautiful uh, work, and, and it's really fun to, 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 to see. So well, thank, thank you for you. coming on. Thank you. All righty. So we've reached the end of our show, Rogue Artisans and Crafters, and we thank you at home for joining us and learning about our featured artist, Linda Hoffman Snodgrass. We wish to thank Linda for agreeing to come on to the show to discuss her life as an artist and her work. I encourage you, the viewer, to visit Linda's official site at lindahoffmansnodgrass.com, along with her official Facebook page, and to make a trip to explore her work in person by visiting Art and Soul Gallery, where her work is featured when you are in Ashland. We also want to thank our crew who have made it possible to put this program together, and to thank Art and Soul Gallery for their wonderful studio facility, which allows us to produce shows such as this one. If you'd like to become a studio producer and create your own public access show, you can contact RVTV to learn how. You can watch the show on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. and Thursday evenings at 11.30 p.m. on Channel 15 of the Ashland Home Network and in the rest of Southern Oregon via Charter Cable on Channel 182. You can also find all episodes of Rogue Artisans and Crafters at archive.org and you can also visit RVTV online at rvtv.sou.edu to find live streaming of all RVTV shows. You can also follow our show on Facebook by visiting and liking our official show page. Just search for Rogue Artisans and Crafters. I'm your host, David Glamour Dave Ninow, and we will see you next time. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah.